Welcome to The Blink 2, Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman's Lives of the Stoics. The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. Narrated by me, Brian Dozy. So at the core of Stoicism, really what it all boils down to is a single question. How should I live? And in practical, concrete terms, how should I react to hardship? How should I react to happiness? What goals should I pursue? Which values should I live by? What should I do in this life on a day-to-day basis so that when it comes to an end, I can look back and regard it as well-lived? Now, you've probably wrestled with these questions before, and the Stoic philosophers that you're about to meet in this blink definitely have answers. They believed that the summum bonum, that is, the highest good, the summum bonum, is virtue. But what's virtue? Zeno, Stoicism's founding thinker, divided virtue into four types. Courage, wisdom, moderation, it's also sometimes referred to as temperance, and justice. These are the virtues that the Stoics sought to live by and that they thought everyone should live by. Courage, wisdom, moderation, justice. The Stoics believed these qualities were the surest path to a virtuous life, to a good life. You'll notice I'm emphasizing the word life. That's because Stoicism is not an armchair philosopher's philosophy. It's about deeds, not words about how you move through the world, how you act, how you live. So who were the Stoics? How did they live their lives? Well, that's what you're about to find out. We'll journey to ancient Greece and Rome and familiarize ourselves with the fascinating biographies of the most famous Stoic thinkers. We'll discover how they lived Stoicism's core virtues. Once again, courage, wisdom, moderation, and justice and how they applied these virtues at the end of their lives. So let's do it. Let's go back to the very beginning, to Greece in the 4th century BCE, where a shipwreck gave birth to the philosophy that we know as Stoicism. Here we are, on the island of Cyprus in the 4th century BCE. With us on this island is a man named Zeno. He's a wealthy merchant, and he makes his living trading in a rare purple dye. This dye, which enslaved laborers make from the blood of sea snails, is in high demand among the rich and powerful, who use it to color their sumptuous robes. It's a good life. Zeno is comfortable. He wants for nothing. But today, tragedy strikes. The ship carrying Zeno's precious cargo is wrecked at sea. And just like that, with the swiftness of a crashing wave, all is lost. Zeno and his family are left with nothing. This story is one possible account of Zeno's misfortune. In another, he was on the ship. Or maybe he actually was safely on land. We don't know. But we do know how he reacted. Some people, probably most people, would have been broken by this devastating turn of events. But not Zeno. He confronted his bad luck with resilience and courage, exactly the sort of qualities that Stoicism would come to represent. Rather than cursing his fate, he embraced it. He moved to the city of Athens, the beating heart of ancient Greece, and reinvented himself as a philosopher. He even went so far as to praise his fate— Well done, fortune, he's said to have said, to drive me thus to philosophy. Fourth century Athens was the perfect place for a budding philosopher. Fueled both by business and, shamefully, by the slave trade, the city was a commercial success. Its educated elite had plenty of time to ponder life's biggest existential questions. Before long, Zeno found a respected teacher, a man named Crates of Thebes, who introduced him to the basics of philosophy. Zeno's education began with a rather eccentric lesson. Crates asked Zeno to carry a pot of lentil soup across the city. Believing that this task was beneath him, Zeno took the soup through the back streets in an attempt to avoid being seen. Crates was having none of that. 
He came up to Zeno and tipped the soup down his legs so that it was plain for all to see. The lesson was simple. Zeno should care less about what other people thought of him. Before long, Zeno became a respected philosopher in his own right. He founded a new philosophy called, you guessed it, Stoicism, and formulated its four guiding principles, courage, wisdom, moderation, and justice. Like the Stoics who came after him, Zeno believed that philosophy should not be confined to the classroom, but should instead be put into action in daily life. So rather than shouting from a bell tower or speaking in a grand lecture hall, Zeno and his followers discussed their ideas in the middle of the city, on the Stoa Poikili, the painted porch of the Agora of Athens, which is where Stoicism gets its name from, the Stoa in Stoa Poikili. And that is perhaps the greatest testament to Zeno's modesty. Rather than naming his philosophy after himself, he named it after the porch on which he taught. Next up, we'll meet one of the people who studied on that porch, a student of Zeno's named Cleanthes. Our next Stoic philosopher, Cleanthes, was one of Zeno's most devoted students. His family, unlike Zeno's, was poor, and he struggled and toiled his entire life. At first, out of necessity, later, by choice. Born on the Aegean coast in 330 BCE, Cleanthes came to Athens as a young man, and he made his money primarily as a water carrier. It was tough work, drawing water from a well, carrying it among the city's numerous gardens, returning to the well for more water. His toil was so constant that he was dubbed Phryantiles, a pun on the name Cleanthes. In Greek, Phryantiles means water boy. And a water boy he remained for his entire life. It's likely, though we can't say for certain, that Cleanthes didn't meet Zeno and begin his philosophical studies until he was nearly 50 years old, and he'd been carrying water that entire time. But even after meeting Zeno, even after he began to make a name for himself as a philosopher, Cleanthes kept working. Despite being offered vast financial gifts by wealthy patrons, despite his aging body, he studied by day and carried water by night. Why? Well, for Cleanthes, work was not merely a means to money. He believed that philoponia, a love of labor, was as important as philosophia, a love of wisdom. It's perhaps not hard to see why. Both require discipline, a virtue that falls under the category of moderation. Both require industriousness, a virtue that falls under the category of courage. And what's more, physical labor, though exhausting, allows the mind to wander, to observe things and people. It gives us the headspace, the stillness, to think about our ideas quietly while carrying out our tasks. Like many true Stoics, Cleanthes also lived a very frugal life. He was even reported to write down his thoughts on oyster shells and ox bones so that he didn't have to buy papyrus paper. But these deprivations, just like the exertions of water carrying, didn't bother him at all. Quite the opposite. He embraced them. Now, not everyone appreciated this hard-working, penny-pinching philosophy student, this paragon of moderation. His fellow Athenians mocked the fact that he'd spent 20 years studying under Zeno, his teacher. For this, he was dubbed a simpleton, a sluggish lump of stone that could not be molded. But Cleanthes handled his critics with good humor. Instead of being offended when people laughed at him, he often responded by poking fun at himself. And we know that he was not a simpleton, not a lump of stone. Disciplined, hardworking, indifferent to discomfort, yes, but not unfeeling or unintelligent. He wrote many books grappling with topics ranging from pleasure to ethics, physics to logic. He loved poetry and wrote it himself. And to the very end, and he lived for 100 years, likely longer than any other Stoic, Cleanthes dedicated himself to the pursuit of virtue. From Athens, we now travel to Rome, soaring not only over land and sea, but across the centuries. Between the death of Cleanthes and the birth of our next Stoic, Cato the Younger, more than a hundred years passed, and there lived 
Diogenes, the first Stoic, according to Cicero, to write about practical political questions. There lived Antipater, who helped shape the Stoic system of ethics. And then there was Cicero, born a decade before Cato. Cicero, who, though not a Stoic himself, grappled with Stoicism's thorniest questions and immortalized many of its theories in writing. Why skip them and include Cato the Younger? Because Cato, as much as any other Stoic, and perhaps more, lived Stoicism. He earned his place in history not with words, but with deeds. Born in Rome in 95 BCE, Cato seems always to have possessed the qualities that defined his life. Courage, incorruptibility, and an unwavering dedication to justice and freedom. Here is a telling example. When Cato was just four years old, an imposing soldier upset about some issue related to citizenship came to his home. Cato's uncle was in a position of power, and the man wanted Cato to speak on his behalf. Cato refused. So the soldier tried to scare him, picking him up and dangling him by the ankles from a high balcony. Cato remained impassive. He didn't plead for his life. He didn't even blink. And in the end, the soldier pulled him back up and had to acknowledge that he'd been bested by a little boy. And as he was as a boy, so he remained as a man. Unafraid, unflappable, unconcerned with everything except what was right. Here is a handful of cases in point. As a child, he stood up to bullies defending younger kids against older ones. At the age of 23, he volunteered for military service. That was unnecessary, but he felt he had to do it and fought bravely against Spartacus for three years. At the age of 27, he became a military tribune, which was an office in the military and was the only uncorrupt candidate abiding by all campaigning laws. Now, this was the man, upright, uncorrupt, who in 65 BCE at the age of 30 took public office and joined the Roman Senate. His single mission, root out corruption and help Rome, which he believed was straying from the true path, get back on track. Here are some things he did. Fired corrupt employees, came to work before everyone else, left work after everyone else, refused luxurious job perks, refused to wear fancy clothes, didn't throw parties, didn't wear perfume, didn't wear shoes in the streets of Rome. The list goes on and on. Now, did all this rectitude irk his fellow senators? Yes. Did it make him enemies? You bet. To the less morally upright, Cato's very presence was a constant rebuke. But he was indifferent to their opinion. He didn't care what they thought. He didn't care what anyone thought. The only thing to which he wasn't indifferent was virtue. Only one thing mattered, doing what was right, always. The rest be damned. It was a noble stance, to say the least, but in the end, his refusal to compromise on his convictions led to his death. Cato believed in the Roman Republic, and he resisted the dictatorial rise of Caesar, but not enough to compromise on his convictions. When Pompey, one of the political elite with whom Cato didn't always agree, asked to marry Cato's daughter, hoping to form a political alliance, Cato refused. And so Pompey instead formed an alliance with Caesar, marrying his daughter, Julia. The marriage gave Caesar a major political boost, and together the two men forged a new and autocratic future for Rome. This might have been avoided had Cato chosen to descend from his moral high ground just a little and formed an alliance with Pompey. Cato resisted Caesar at every turn, both before and after he crossed the Rubicon, precipitating civil war in Rome. Now we know the rest of the story. Caesar won, despite everything Cato had done to stop him. Obstinate to the end, Cato refused to live under Caesar, under an autocrat. And so he didn't. He spent his last evening reading Socrates. And in the morning, upon awakening, he took his sword and drove it into his breast, facing death as bravely as a four-year-old boy had once faced the threats of a soldier. As we traverse the philosophical landscape of antiquity, you may be wondering, where are all the women? Unfortunately, much as in the rest of human history, women have mostly been erased from the story of Stoicism. 
Still, there's no greater example of Stoic fortitude than the unsung women who endured all the same tyranny, wars, and hardships as their male counterparts. They gave birth, without pain relief, to the Zenos and Cleanthes and Catos of ancient Greece and Rome, but their struggles and sacrifices went unrecorded and unappreciated by the history books. There is, however, one woman whose Stoic actions have been recorded, the daughter of Cato the Younger, Portia Cato. After suffering the loss of her first husband during Rome's civil war, Portia remarried a man named Brutus. While married to Portia, Brutus, along with some co-conspirators, plotted to kill Julius Caesar, who was now the emperor and dictator of Rome. Aware that her husband was planning something, but unsure of exactly what, Portia decided to take extreme action to show Brutus that she was a worthy confidant. Now, Most of us would simply ask to be told what the plot was, but Portia, a true Stoic, knew that actions speak louder than words. So she took a knife and, in Brutus's absence, stabbed herself in the thigh. When Brutus returned home, he found her pale and shaking, weak from loss of blood. Look, Portia said, at the pain I can endure. By thus wounding herself, she demonstrated her tough, stoic character, proving that she'd be able to withstand extreme pain if necessary. She wanted to show him that even if tortured, she wouldn't break down under interrogation. Upon seeing this proof of his wife's iron will, Brutus immediately shared the details of the plot with her. And when, on March 15th, he and his co-conspirators assassinated Caesar, stabbing him some 23 times, Portia was waiting at home, praying that everything had gone to plan. This was not the last time that Portia would demonstrate her stoic courage and indifference to pain. Just two years after Caesar's assassination, Brutus was killed in a civil war started by Mark Antony, one of Caesar's diehard supporters. Now, there are conflicting accounts of Portia's response, but one writer reports that when Portia learned of her husband's death, she rushed to the fireplace and swallowed hot coals, taking her own life, just as her father had taken his. Like her father before her, she refused to live under an oppressive regime, and she faced her fate with the same courage and calm decisiveness. Seneca the Younger is perhaps the most famous Stoic philosopher of all time. He's best remembered for his literary accomplishments, especially for a book of philosophical letters called, aptly enough, Moral Letters. But although Seneca is celebrated for his words on moral judgment, his actions were far from morally irreprehensible. Seneca may have always tried to embody Stoic virtues, but in his case, embracing one virtue led him to turn his back on many others. Here's the story. According to Stoic philosophy, we all have a moral duty to involve ourselves in politics in order to contribute to the public good. Perhaps it was this Stoic principle that, in 50 CE, drove Seneca to take up an invitation to tutor a 12-year-old boy, the adopted son of Emperor Claudius. This boy was named Nero. But Nero's behavior was cruel and entitled, lazy and vain. Seneca tried to teach him the Stoic values of wisdom, justice, and mercy, but with little success. Even as a child, Nero showed unmistakable signs of the man and the ruler that he would become. Four years later, Nero's mother, Agrippina, murdered his father Claudius, clearing the way for the 16-year-old Nero to become emperor himself. And it wasn't long before this new boy emperor gave his own brutal tendencies free reign. First, Nero murdered his mother. He then ordered the death of every male relative who might be a future rival to the throne. Where was Seneca during this bloodshed? Shamefully, he was right by Nero's side as his faithful teacher. For the next 15 years, Seneca remained loyal to Nero, even as the young emperor revealed himself to be a tyrannical psychopath. Though Seneca did encourage Nero to have mercy on his enemies, he didn't have the courage or the self-discipline to walk away when his words were ignored. Instead, Seneca took the opportunity to amass more wealth than any other philosophy in history and lived a decadent lifestyle. 
He may have told himself that he was doing his stoic political duty by staying so close to power, but in reality, his wealth was built on Nero's evil deeds. Ultimately, Seneca lacked Cato's and Portia's moral strength, though his death did resemble theirs. In the end, Seneca turned on Nero and was complicit in a failed assassination plot. As punishment, Nero ordered him to kill himself, a task that didn't prove as easy as he might have thought. During his life, Seneca had written extensively on death, arguing that it is not a future event, but something that is happening to us every day, every second, and that the day that we die is, in fact, the day we stop dying. First, Seneca slit his wrists. When this didn't work, he drank poison. This, too, didn't take immediate effect. So he was moved to a steaming bath, an image that has been immortalized in paintings by Peter Paul Rubens and Jacques-Louis David. And at last, Seneca stopped dying. To be a Stoic is to be preoccupied with freedom. Cleanthes found a kind of freedom in labor, the freedom to think as he worked, the mental stillness that accompanies physical exertion. Both Cato and his daughter Portia chose death over the unfreedom of life in an oppressive regime. And Seneca wrote, Freedom is the prize we are working for, not being a slave to anything. But none of these Stoics was truly enslaved. Epictetus, however, our next Stoic, was born into enslavement, a condition in which he remained until he was 30 years old. When he finally gained his freedom, he chose to dedicate himself entirely to philosophy. And in the years remaining to him, he taught and lectured, spreading Stoicism across the land. Eventually, he attracted great crowds and gained not only significant prominence, but the admiration of prominent men, such as the Emperor Hadrian. Though, like Socrates and Cato, he never committed a word to the page, many of his teachings have come down to us, captured in a book by a diligent student. These teachings were, unsurprisingly, colored by the wretched experience of enslavement. For example, he taught that all situations have two handles. One handle is strong, the other is weak. Now, we may not be in control of the situation, as Epictetus so often wasn't, but we can choose the handle. If we are delayed on a trip, will we curse our fate and grow enraged, or will we embrace the extra time to think and admire the scenery? Epictetus taught that our reaction to situations, the handle we choose to grasp, will shape the kind of life we lead, as well as the kind of person we'll become. Epictetus despised two faults above all others, the inability to restrain oneself and the inability to endure difficulties. He gave two words to help guide his students, persist and resist. Persist in what is virtuous and resist what is not. Simple in theory, but difficult in practice. He also warned against the enslaving powers of external rewards, not only ambition is dangerous, not only greed, but also the desire for travel and learning and leisure. These are external things, and as such, they can be taken from you or denied to you. They are not bad in and of themselves, but your happiness should not hinge on things you can't control. The wise decision is to focus on internals, the things that no one can take, your temper, your ego, the way you react, the handle you choose. All of these teachings had a great influence on our next and last Stoic figure, Marcus Aurelius, a man whose writings are very much with us, but who also took another of Epictetus' teachings to heart. Don't explain your philosophy. Embody it. It's often said that absolute power is absolutely corrupting. And all too often, history has shown this to be the case. But our final Stoic figure, seems to be the exception to the rule. Through the shining example of his own life and leadership, he showed us what humanity is truly capable of. And it was arguably through his stoicism that he achieved such greatness. Listener, meet Marcus Aurelius, the world's first philosopher king. Born to a respected Roman family in 121 CE, 
Marcus was just 17 years old when the heirless emperor Hadrian chose him as his successor and invited him to join the imperial family. While many young men would let this huge change in fortune go to their heads, Marcus remained the kind and humble boy he'd always been. Even when he moved into the palace, he still visited his tutor's houses rather than letting them come to him. Incredibly, one of his first acts was to share power with his adoptive brother, Lucius, naming him co-emperor. Consider what a radical act this was when other rulers, like Nero, had murdered their rivals. But Marcus's benevolence didn't stop there. When he learned that one of his closest political allies, Cassius, was plotting a coup against him, Marcus quickly forgave the conspirators for their betrayal and wept when someone killed Cassius in revenge. A true Stoic, Marcus ensured his decisions were always guided by the interests of ordinary Romans rather than his own comfort. Just consider his actions when the Roman Empire was ravaged by the Antonine Plague. Needing to refill Rome's dwindling treasury, Marcus could easily have raised his people's taxes. But instead, he took all the ornaments from his imperial palaces and sold them to the highest bidder. From Marcus's writings, we know that he worked hard to live up to his Stoic philosophy. In his book, Meditations, he writes about his feelings of jealousy, anger, and lust. But whereas many of us give in to these emotions, Marcus sought to master them. He writes of finding guidance in Stoic wisdom, using it to create a moral framework for his leadership. Ultimately, Marcus Aurelius's life and writings are perhaps the most potent demonstration of the power of Stoicism. He used it to improve himself, to hold himself accountable, to strive toward an ideal self and a virtuous life. And his example, captured in his writings, is proof that we can do the same. <laughs>